science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hello, everybody. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. Do we dare cross our fingers and say the winter is over in Alberta, Canada? I think Bunsen is hoping there's more winter, but I think the worst of it's over. Chris can start to rejoice. I think we're going to go into a very short spring and then summertime. Actually, right now, this is the start of the dry grass time in central Alberta, which means there could be grass fires everywhere. So we go right out of the right out of the winter into like possible fires. <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild, actually. The dogs were sure happy to be back with us from Comic-Con. If you remember last weekend, we went to Comic-Con and we had a ton of fun. In fact, our family section, that's all we talked about. <laughs> Don't worry, this week we've got some pet stories for everybody. If you listen to this within a couple days of the podcast coming out, we have some really exciting news that's coming out on Saturday. So be prepared to listen to and look for that on social media and Bunsen turns five on Saturday. Bunsen's birthday is May 7th and he will be five and we're just so happy to celebrate the birthday with the big guy. He's just happy to be with everybody. His best birthday would just be with everybody. Okay, what's on the science podcast for this week? In science news, we're going to talk about a new sleep molecule. (laughs) It's called hypocratin. Okay, I've never heard of it. Let's let's check it out. And in pet science, we got tagged by a bunch of folks about this study. And I have a special secret about this dog study. We are going to talk to the author on Twitter Spaces. But let's let's break down what's going on in this study before we get to Kathleen Morrill. Now that's not the expert this week. The expert this week is T. Francis, who's an arachnologist. That's right. Somebody who's an expert in spiders. Hey dogs, what kind of a computer does a spider use? The webcam. (laughs) This is an untapped area of amazing puns. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. (laughs) What do you call it when you uh, have too many spiders in your house? You have a no-fly zone. (laughs) Okay, before we lose any more subscribers, let's get on with the show. Because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, let's take a look at a new study from the University of Copenhagen about a new sleep molecule. I've never heard of it. Well, it's a small molecule in brain cells that affects the level of hypocretin. Okay, what the heck is hypocretin? Well, we have to break that down first. Now, I went down a rabbit hole trying to figure out what hypocretins are. The the research I came up with kind of coke kind of goes this way hypocretins are also known as orexins so these are i guess receptors in the hypothalamic region of the brain they help regulate how much we want to eat but they also are regarded as about what keeps us awake or um keeps us asleep It gets pretty complicated and probably outside of my ability to break this down without getting super confusing and going much too detailed. But in a way, orexins or hypocretins, they help keep you in a state of arousal or wakefulness. They... They're neurons that through a complicated series of pathways, like how much blood glucose you have to other things in the body, sense the inner and outer environment, what's going on outside your body and what's going on inside your body and maintain the right situation of being awake or the right situation of being asleep. That's what an erection is. Okay. So back to the study, there is a lot of evidence and a lot of pharmaceutical drugs around hypocretin it's suspected and it's thought to play a role in insomnia right so if you know anybody who suffers from insomnia it's debilitating um if you cannot get to sleep it can cause huge amounts of anxiety wreck your next day and also it can play a role in narcolepsy which is just an inability to stay awake during the day just you fall asleep it is thought that people who suffer from insomnia may have too much of hypocretin in the brain and people who suffer from narcolepsy may have not enough so it seems like this little regulated regulatory protein keeps you too much awake if you've got too much of it and not awake enough if you don't so the pharmaceutical drugs are all around the ability to turn it on or turn it off so you can go to sleep or stay awake 
It's pretty complicated, but it breaks down pretty simply to a molecule called microRNA. It's got a fancy name, microRNA 137. This little tiny RNA molecule regulates hypocritin. So it is like the it is the it is the signal that makes more of this protein or less of this protein. Can you find this micro RNA molecule everywhere? Um, you can. You can find it all throughout the body, but there there appears to be pronounced levels of it in the brain. And it is true. There it is true that micro RNA regulates a whole bunch of other things, cell processes, and one of those cell processes is the hypocretin levels. Through detailed studies in mouse brains, they found that the downregulation of this microRNA-137 in the hypocretin neurons seems to uh, consolidate wakefulness. So it appears that as you make less of microRNA-137, the hypocretin levels creep up. The more hypocretin, the more wakefulness, the more awake you are. The idea of upregulation, so more of the mRNA-137, means there might be less hypocretin, which means you are not as awake. Now, this wasn't in people, right? They, they, they were using uh, brains of mice, but they were able to show that it was common across brain, the brains of mice and zebrafish. The team was also able to show that injections of mRNA-137 into the tissue showed that there was less of the hypocritin formed. um, Because remember, as I said, as you increase this mRNA-137, you have less hypocretin. And that's exactly what it seemed to show. They injected the mRNA and the same pathways started to happen that affected the hypocretin levels. Cool. They were also able to show that there were genetic mutations within that mRNA-137, which caused daytime sleepiness. So twofold in conclusion, micro mRNA in the study led to higher and lower levels of hypocretin. Hypocretin is also known as orexins <laughs> and they help regulate how awake or how sleepy we are during the day. Too much hypocretin, you're awake too much, too little, and you're asleep all the time. This is just one area of sleep studies that could really help folks out who are suffering from um, the inability to fall asleep or nar- narcolepsy. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, we are going to talk about a giant dog study. Now, we got tagged so many times by this on social media. When there's a new study that kind of makes the rounds on the big press, like uh, I'm talking your CBCs, your CBSs, um, CNN, Fox. What's the other one in the States? I don't know. Um, When it makes those big news stations, people are like, ooh, dog science. Let's tell Bunsen and Beaker. (laughs) Yeah, we got sent that study. Now, the exciting thing is that we will be talking to one of the authors of the study, as a guest on Twitter Spaces, um, I believe, I believe at the end of June, and her name is Kathleen Morrill. She was actually on the podcast two years ago as a grad student, and this big paper was just released. There was a big embargo. We were going to have her on the show earlier, but um, she couldn't talk about her study. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And uh, if you're listening to the podcast, come with great questions for Kathleen in a little bit. You should be able to answer them live. Now, this is a breed versus behavior study. We've looked at these studies before, and I'm trying to remember the last time we talked about one where there were like some breeds had specific behaviors that were different than other breeds. So the the study that I'm trying to think where it was from, I think it was a European study it showed that there were some breed specific characteristics. Now this study shows kind of the opposite. The study size was enormous, absolutely enormous. They took the genetic information of the dogs and paired it with the dog breeds or the dog's behavior. Only a tiny percent of overall behavior was linked to the breeds, 9%. So that means 9% of the traits the genetic traits that make a dog a dog of a certain breed were linked with a behavior trait in the survey that was statistically significant. The rest, 91% of the behavior had no bearing what breed they came from at all. Now, if you think of it, it might be a little bit counterintuitive. Pick any kind of dog breed, Chihuahua. 
Boston Terrier, Bernice Mountain Dog, Golden Retriever. What behavior do you associate with that breed? Well, if you're associating some behaviors with that breed, the evidence in this huge study doesn't seem to link up. This comes from um, this comes from a data set called Darwin's Ark. We actually tweeted about Darwin's Ark a couple years ago, where you could um, put do a big survey about your dog's behaviors, what type of dog you were, and if you wanted to, you could put your name in to have them send you a genetic swab, and then your the dog's genes would be part of the study. The survey is huge; over eighteen thousand pet owners responded. That's a huge huge data set. And there were tons of questions. I remember doing the questions on Darwin's Ark for for both Bunsen and Beaker. And when we tweeted it out, people had a lot of fun doing that questionnaire. One thing that I find really fascinating about the study is they included mixed breed dogs or quote unquote mutts. And the reason why that was so important when I when I was looking at the study, they made a special note of this is that when you have a certain dog breed, it may have some behavior stereotypes. So in the survey, you're more prone to say, my German Shepherd is barky. My golden retriever likes to retrieve. But when you have a mixed breed and you're not 100% certain what kind of breed it is or what it makes it up, there's less stereotyping. And they found that people were able to answer maybe without bias, which is really, really important in, in survey using surveys in science. So if you're listening to this, you might be like, you know what? Um, that's that's a bunch of baloney. My dog is a blah, 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 and it does this behavior, and that is a breed-specific behavior. <laughs> and they did find some. Remember, there was 9% of the, of the traits that the dogs had were linked pretty conclusively to their breed and their genetics. <laughs> There's a note of some things like <laughs> um, golden retrievers rarely howl. Um, in the survey, but there's some golden retriever owners that responded that their golden retriever howls all the time. (laughs) So dogs, even amongst breeds with some of the genetic traits that are linked to their behavior, um, there was individuals among the traits that were linked the strongest to the breed were functional traits. Now you have to remember dogs were bred a couple hundred years ago, almost all of the different breeds of dogs were were bred for a specific role. Bunsen was bred, Bernese Mountain Dogs were bred to pull carts. And all of the other traits that we associate with Bernese Mountain Dogs being friendly or gentle or a little bit standoffish, those can be applied to a lot of their dog breeds. But the functional traits, herding, retrieving, pulling, those were the strongest uh, linkages between the genes and what people report the dogs were doing. So I can't wait to talk to Kathleen about this study live on Twitter Spaces. But I think going over the study gives everybody a little bit of homework <laughs> if you're going to show up to that um, chat. I find it fascinating. I, I just love learning more about dogs, that there are some traits, a small amount, that are linked to breeds. But the most of them are just as individual as humans are. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I would just give you some ideas about how you could support the Science Podcast. Number one, you could support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com backslash Bunsen Burner. There's multiple tiers of support, and the lowest tier of support is not much more than a cup of coffee a month. The second way is you could check out our merch shop. We've worked really hard to partner with clothing companies that do a great job of providing vibrant colors and soft feels. We also have the Beaker Stuffy for sale. It's so cute. The third way you could support us is giving us great reviews on our podcast playing apps. Any kind of review helps. And if you can't find a review, share our podcast with people. Thanks, everybody. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast. And I have T. Francis, arachnologist, with me today. How are you today, T? I am doing great. Thank you very much. How are you? I am so excited to talk to you um, because we're going to talk about spiders. And we have not talked about spiders yet on the podcast. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Where, Where are you calling into the podcast from? Where are you in the world? I'm just outside London in the UK. So are you born and raised UK person or like you're there for work study? No, born and raised. I'm still living in the same part of the country that I was born in and grew up in. I have 
been around all kinds of other places. I did live in America for a while. I was living in Los Angeles for a few years, but I found my way back here. (laughs) My son plays in a marching band and they went to London and it was a very cool experience for them. It made me kind of jealous because I had to stay home. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, London is a cool place. Yeah, um, he did. They did bamboozle a whole bunch of the kids. So there was a bit of a culture shock with yeah. the cars on the other side of the road. I don't know if you found that when you went to Los Angeles. Oh, it was yeah. probably a little stressful. Yeah, the other I way. mean, over over here, like we because we're so close to mainland Europe, it's the same in mainland Europe, like France, Spain, Germany. They all drive on the same side of the road as America and you know Canada and places. So <laughs> I'm used to it from going over to France. You know, it's all the wrong way around over there, but in America. I don't know, everything's so much bigger as well. And there's so many more lanes on the freeways. And it was just like, as, as well as having to get used to being on the wrong side of everything, everything was like crazy huge. And fast. I was like, okay, I'm just going to sit this one out and let someone else drive. <laughs> it's just and like Canada, it's so spread out. Like we yeah. just have, like Canada is just so much land, whereas you're, you know, the United yeah. Kingdom's an island sort of. So yeah, and you kind of like, run out of space to like yeah, make things. Our roads are all like crazy old as well. So they were built for, you know, horses and like carts and things. So like a lot of the roads are really tiny and really windy. Whereas over there, they're like really big, really wide, really straight, you know? So, yeah. Right. So probably the the last place the self-driving cars will have success is those roads. They'll get all bamboozled, (laughs) hey? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. The car would be like, no, I can't. So anyways... (laughs) Um, so let's talk, let's talk about you. You're, you are an arachnologist. Um, mm-hmm. Could you tell everybody what your training is? Like what, uh, you, what is your education? Yeah, so I currently hold a bachelor's in uh, joint honors in animal biology and ecology. Um, I was intending to go back and get my master's and eventual PhD just before the pandemic started. Like my whole plan of action was to go back to university and do all of that and start mm-hmm. refining my areas of interest like my main area of interest is taxonomy like I, I'm all about taxonomy and looking at tiny things under microscopes so I wanted to sort of follow that path but then you know pandemic happened and I've had to kind of put it on hold but I figured that it was a good opportunity to just involve myself as much as I possibly could in science just off my own back and be as active as I can in the field without actually being in an institution like you know studying at a university or employed by you know, whatever. So everything that I'm doing at the moment is off my own back. And my my credentials, I suppose, are pretty much things that I've been involving myself in just out of the sheer passion for it and my need to be learning something all the time and my desire to make a contribution to the field of arachnology and like arachnid taxonomy. So that means that over the last couple of years, I've been doing voluntary work with um, uh, organizations like the British Arachnological Society, the American mm-hmm. Arachnological Society, working very closely with a, a lab in Vancouver who work with spiders. They they study the behavioral ecology of spiders in the tropics. Um, and just sort of being as hands-on as an involved, as an, oh my goodness, sorry, as involved as I possibly can be. So that's where I'm at right now. Well, that your your story gives me the warm fuzzies. I don't know if um, spiders have the warm fuzzies, but that's uh, we can get into that a little later. Uh, so you are bit. You said you're big into taxonomy. You are if involved in science. How, yeah. w- when you when you were young, did you get bit by the science bug? Pun included. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's been a lifelong thing for me. Like my interest in spiders and my love for spiders has been as long as I can remember. But not just that; just my curiosity for the world around me and tiny things. You know, I can remember one of the things I was given for I don't know Christmas or birthday one year was a kid's microscope set. I still have it up in the loft. It's this amazing uh, little set with like um, just a microscope. It doesn't plug in or anything. It's one that's got a mirror on it, so you can shine. You know, sort of like focus light. Um, up through the floor of the microscope just using this little mirror and it came with these like preloaded slides with just cool stuff like plant cells and just you know maybe like an insect leg or something like that that Mm -hmm. I could look at under this microscope and then a few slides and cover slips for me to make my own which I was just so mind blown by I was like oh my god science yes so I had this (laughs) big, (laughs) big thing for science from like way early on and you know as a kid I dipped my toe in things like chemistry and physics 
physics and stuff as well. And they just they just didn't light me up the same way biology did. Biology mm. is just there's just something magical about it, you know. So yeah, it's been a lifelong thing, and it's something that I've been very much split down the middle of my entire life between science and art. Um, so whereas I've been involved actively in science, you know, in whatever way I can involve myself in it over the years, I've worked professionally as an artist. So like, I don't know, they cross over at some point, this appreciation for detail and tiny things and just, mm-hmm. I don't know, applying artistic ability to being, you know, to drawing the things that I see under the microscope and stuff. It's something that I've always loved and something that I've always done. You know, as I talk to scientists on the podcast, and we've interviewed hundreds of scientists, that's a that's a, a a theme I keep keep seeing come up is there is a connection between their the love of science and whatever they study, but also creativity and art, and mm-hmm. not necessarily art art in the traditional sense, but creativity too. So yeah. I hear you. I hear you there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Yep. I was going to say it has its uses, you know, it's like there's a lot of um, very important application for illustrative skills in the sciences. So hmm. it's it makes sense. There you go. And sticking with something, practicing it over and over, knowing you probably started not so great and then you get better over time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's talk about spiders. Um I don't know where to go, but I'd love for you to talk to us about spiders. Is there, is, what do you love about them? What would you like our listeners to know about spiders? The main message that I try to get across with all of the outreach and like science communication stuff that I do concerning spiders is that they're amazing and they're not to be feared. So many people have this fear of spiders that completely (laughs) cuts them off from appreciating what they're actually all about. And There's so much diversity. There's so much beauty. There's so much interesting behavior. There's so much just like fascinating information that we've learned over the years about spiders. There's just so much to them that people never get a chance to see because they're immediately afraid of them because, you know, it's it's what society kind of tells you from a young age that you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be weirded out by spiders and a bit scared of them, you know? And it's, it's you know, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair to the spiders. It's not fair to people because you're missing out on a lot of really, really cool stuff. So I think, you know, my my main sort of message straight away is hear me out. <laughs> I know spiders <laughs> might freak you out a bit, but hear me out. Spiders are really, really cool. And here's why. <laughs> so then we start getting into, you know, all of the different things about them that might kind of pique somebody's curiosity if they've never really paid much attention to them before. What's going to get them to pay a bit of attention to them now? So I might start showing them pictures of spiders that, you know, you might look at and think, oh, actually, you know what, that's really cute. So you might have seen pictures of jumping spiders, for example, with their big eyes, these big, cute <laughs> eyes. You know, Lucas the Spider, the animation that's been a huge thing for like pro spider propaganda, <laughs> like showing people something. <laughs> pro really spider huge. propaganda. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm all about the pro spider propaganda. I've got a whole arsenal of it. You know, cute yeah. spiders, colorful spiders, fascinating spiders, the whole lot. So, yeah, you know, show people spiders that even, you know, even if they're scared, they're going to have to take a step back and think, yeah, actually, you know what? I can see what you're saying. That is kind of cute. So jumping spiders are great for that. Big, cute eyes, fluffy, nice colors, you know. Mm. Um, Then you've got spiders that are like all different colors of the rainbow that are just so stunningly beautiful to look at. You know, the Brazilian jeweled, um, what is it? The Brazilian jeweled tarantula. Um, I go by scientific names, so common names escape me a lot. But the scientific <laughs> name for this one I'm referring to is Typhoclina celadonia, and it is these unbelievable metallic jeweled colors. It's got magenta oh. on it. It's got teal on it. It's got emerald green on it. It's got these beautiful black tiger scri- stripes on its abdomen. It's absolutely stunning. And mm-hmm. it's a dwarf tarantula. So although it's a tarantula, it's only really tiny. It gets to sort of maybe a couple of inches across, like leg span. So... It's a little, tiny, fluffy, brightly colored, beautiful spider. So, you know, but um, I've gone off on a massive tangent just talking about spiders that are beautiful. Oh, I'm, I'm just listening with rapt attention. If you just want to name spiders and how cute they are, we could do this for an hour. <laughs> T, T if you want to do that, go ahead. Like, I'm just smiling ear to ear. <laughs> It'll be a whole podcast series of its own if I start doing that. And people keep telling me to do it. They keep telling me to do it, but I, just, I don't even know where to start. But yeah, I don't know. I think just in terms of what I love about them, 
everything. There's just so much. It would take me days and days to sit down and list out everything. You know, we can talk about their appearance all day, but there's behavior as well. And there's adaptations to their environments that just blow my mind on a daily basis. I've had the privilege of keeping a lot of different types of spiders. And there are some that stand out in my mind as being something that I feel honored to have had in my care, you know, so like um, neck casting spiders, also known as ogre faced spiders, um, the family Dinopidae. So the um, the genus that I kept, it was Dinopis. Um, I don't actually know what the species was because they were collected originally in Africa somewhere and not identified. So I have specimens of them that I will be trying to formally identify at some point, but they are absolutely unbelievable they're the strangest looking things they've got these huge great big googly forward facing eyes and (laughs) then like one pair of big googly forward facing eyes and then three other pairs of smaller eyes that face in different directions and they're they're the thing that they do that is so fascinating is they create a net from their silk. They spin a silken net and then they hang themselves from like these support lines of silk. They ha- they support themselves from these silk lines using their rear two pairs of legs and their front two pairs of legs. They hold this net out in front of them. Um, so by four corners, they've got one foot on each of four corners of this net and they hold it out in front of them and they're sort of suspended above the ground or above a leaf or something. And as soon as prey passes by underneath them within range, they spring forward and trap the prey in that net. They basically grab it in a net like, like you know, a hunter would or a fisherman would, you know, and it's just absolutely amazing. I used to watch them spinning those nets and how they would do it. It's, it's just doesn't matter how many times I see it blows my mind <laughs> so you know things like how, that how, can i ask some, some questions t yeah of course yeah okay so like how how big are these spiders like like as big as a thumb half a thumb are they huge um so if i refer to them if or I go even by in length, centimeters like i don't know right like i'm just yeah, i don't so I'm, i don't know by, the scale of these guys yeah, so if we go by, uh, if we talk about just sort of like over, over, overall size, including like the leg span, an adult female, um, her her length would probably be around about the same as my index finger, but oh. an adult male, they've got a very sort of slender, scrawny body and super long legs. So now you're talking more about like maybe a four inch leg span on the males, but wow. they're they're really skinny. So it's not a substantial spider. It's it's all leg, you know, um, it's <laughs> a little, little tiny skinny body. But the females, they're a bit chunkier. They're a bit more substantial. So like a female's body is probably mm, say abdomen's maybe like thumbnail size, oh. and you know. They, so they're not they, tiny. They're, they're no, they're not tiny. No, they're not tiny at all. And I mean, there are lots of different species in the genus Dinopus, and there is some variation in sort of build and size. But the ones that I kept, the females were quite stocky. They were very substantial. So when they were poised and ready with their net, their net could be something like maybe postage stamp size, maybe a bit smaller than that. Um, but you could see it. You could, you know, it wasn't so, so super tiny that you couldn't see the details of that net. It was, it was visibly a net that it had made. And That's the so prey cool. they would be, yeah, the prey they'd be taking would be, say, things like crickets or small locusts that might be anything up to say like an inch long, something like that. So you'd get to see quite a lot of it with <laughs> the naked eye. But there, you know, it sounds I like they're an impatient it. spider. Like they're, you know, the spiders sit and wait for something to land into their net, and these ones are like, nah. Um, we're going to take the yeah, net well, for prey. <laughs> yeah, kind of. I mean, they don't actively go looking for prey. So they'll find a position where they think they're going to be likely to encounter it. Oh. Um, and then they, they will lie in wait. So there is quite a lot of patience involved with these guys. They're not like wolf okay. spiders or jumping spiders, which are active hunters, which actually go out looking for prey and, and rely on you know their eyesight to be able to sort of pick out movement mm-hmm. and go after it. These spiders do have extremely good eyesight, you know, with those big forward facing eyes I was talking about, but they're not active active hunters in that they will suspend themselves in one position and wait gotcha. so yeah yeah they don't okay so they don't sneak about ninja like and then jump out no. and get a cricket okay gotcha yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is one other thing that they are um they have been observed to do i don't know if this has been 100 percent verified yet or not but it's something that people have seen them doing and they're, they're sort of looking into whether or not it's an intentional thing but some of the species i think in australia um have been seen to make what looks like a target mark by using their own poop so their poop is white and they'll they'll leave a dot of white poop on the floor underneath where they've set up their like lines to sort of suspend themselves from and they'll hang themselves above this like target mark of poop and they use it as almost like a depth perception type thing so if something 
walks over it and they see something like move over that, they know that it's within range. So they use that as like a target to be able to pinpoint like where they're going to strike. So if something ends up over that poop mark, they can grab it with that net and they know that they're going to, they're going to get it. Cause they, Oh, that's cool. It's, it's, it's like amazing. a test arrow you shoot and you're like, well, that's how far my bow can reach kind of thing. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. It's so cool. Wow. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> Before we move to the next question, T, is there anything else you'd like to talk about spiders? I don't want to cut off our conversation yeah. there. Yeah, um, I did study spitting spiders quite a lot. Spitting um, spiders? Oh my goodness! Yeah. You have to tell you yeah. have to tell us about spitting spiders. Yes, yeah. spitting spiders are super cool. So, um, a lot of people will be familiar with like the daddy long leg spiders that they see in their rooms. They've got a little tiny body and really long spindly legs. Spitting spiders are not too dissimilar in appearance. Some of them have longer legs than others, but they've got the kind of spindly leg thing going on and like a, a little body, um, not super hairy or like, you know, like some of the very hairy house spiders you see. They're more kind of like long, skinny legs and like this little this little body. But um, the thing that drew me to them originally was their appearance. So spiders are made, their bodies are made up of two segments, unlike insects, which have three. So a spider's body has an abdomen and a cephalothorax, which is basically a head and a thorax smashed together into one segment. Um, a lot of spiders, they'll have quite a bulbous abdomen and then like a small kind of round, flattened-ish cephalothorax. But the spitting spiders, a lot of them I would see their abdomen and their cephalothorax were kind of evenly sized and that cephalothorax is very very domed it's got a very very high dome to it and they're also six-eyed spiders so a lot of spiders most spiders have eight eyes these oh. guys have six eyes and they're arranged in such a way that they're uh, three pairs so they've got one pair in the middle and then they've got two pairs either side of that and if you look at them in a certain way it can almost look like a little clown face, like two eyes and a round sort of black nose. I, that's just how I see it. How my anthropom how how I anthropomorphize them. <laughs> in my mind. Just like a clown face. It's really cute. So that's what drew me. Ooh, that wouldn't be but, good for people that are scared of both clowns and spiders, though. Well, I suppose it could also be looked at as kind of like a cute little animal face because it's like there a little go. black eyes. <laughs> Forget the clown thing. We'll go with a cute little animal. But um, <laughs> the the spitting behavior is fascinating so they are able to spit um this sort of like gloopy gluey venomous substance at what? prey it's venomous too yeah so it's it's kind of it's not silk so it's not like a it's not the same as the silk that they spin it's this sort of like mucusy kind of glue that has some of their venom that they are able to inject into their prey as well contained within it so it they they spit it. What they do is they have spiders have uh, fangs at the end of um, these little appendages called chelicera, which are basically part of their mouth. Um, and these chelicera they're side by side, and they've got the fangs at the end. And what these guys do is they lift their chelicera up, um, so they're facing forward, and squirt the venom from the ends of their fangs in a zigzag fashion so they like move side to side very very quickly you can barely see it happen because they're, they're quite small so you don't see this it's all lightning fast they spit this stuff as they're moving side to side and the result is a zigzag stream of this sticky venomous spit um and it kind of pins whatever they've spat it at down or you know if it's an, a flying insect it gets all over their wings they, they're kind of stuck to themselves they can't fly um, what it does is it allows the spider the opportunity to sort of hang back for a minute, allow the venom to subdue the prey enough for it to then go in and deliver a bite, which will incapacitate the prey enough that it will then be able to start feeding on it. So when I was keeping these guys, I had them, I, I make acrylic enclosures for a lot of my spiders. And I would notice that where they'd been hunting, I could see on the acrylic these like zigzag marks where the venom had hit the acrylic and I, I could see it was I've got macro photos of it because I just thought that's oh. so cool but it's it's amazing so they would they do spin silk but they don't spin a web that they hunt in you know they'll leave silk lines hanging around here and there so like some of their ability to hunt is based on, you know, if they feel movement. A lot of most spiders depend on being able to sense movement, vibrations, you know, movement in the air, all that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. these guys, you know, 
they don't have terribly good eyesight. So they're not seeing something and thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to go after that. They sense its vibrations. They might feel movement in the silk that they've spun that, you know, they're in contact with. Um, as soon as they sense it, they get close enough just to squirt this spit at them. And then, like I said, they hang back for a little while and then they go in and do this, the, the bite and feed thing. But another cool thing about them is the species that I kept, um, Cytodes longipes is the scientific name, the long-legged spitting spider. Um it originally comes from French Guyana, but has spread to a few other tropical areas around the world. Um, they are kind of subsocial. So they're social to an extent. They'll live together in a colony without eating each other quite happily as long as there's plenty of prey. They're not known as a social species. So there are some sp spiders that are known for being social and their whole thing is that they live in social groups. These uh, long-legged spitting spiders, they will live by themselves, but they will also coexist peacefully. And one of the very interesting behaviors that I saw when I was breeding them is um, when the female, uh, her egg sac hatched, like the babies would hang out, she would go and hunt something and bring it back and they would feed on it together. So she was kind of helping them in the beginning by bringing prey back to, you know, where they were all congregated and they would all feed on it together. And then once they got a little bit bigger, they would then go out and start doing it for themselves. But they're very, very cool spiders. Very cool spiders. That is so cool. <laughs> that, I'm just like stunned that, that, that they, there's like the spiders are so varied. Hey, like you mentioned that they're just so different and they're so cool. This oh, is yeah. just illustrating that, right? Like uh, yeah. two completely different ways that they hunt. <laughs> yeah yeah and that's just like the tip of the iceberg <laughs> i know i know again like we could talk about like you said we could talk about this for hours <laughs> yeah. yeah it's very cool very cool well you mentioned that you take photography of spiders and and that you're you have you deal with spiders creatively um you do you, you draw spiders is that correct yes i do and I you do take pictures them. of them Yes. Could you tell everybody like what kind of pictures and illustrations you do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because this is a audio format, right? It's tough to get the yeah. visual across. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I do all kinds of different artwork, really. I think I do a lot of scientific illustrations. So the, uh -huh. the spider illustrations that I prefer to do and that I enjoy the most are the scientific illustrations. So like, I say scientific, natural history illustrations, let's say, the right. the kind of illustrations that represent them accurately um, and that show them as they actually are. I do take some liberties in some of my personal work sometimes, you know, big spiders that are born of my own imagination or, you know, something that I've just plucked out of thin air that doesn't actually exist, but I think I'd quite like to exist, you know, so get a bit creative sometimes, but no, I, I do prefer to draw them as they are. And I use a lot of my own photography as reference for those drawings. So, um, yes, I take macro photos, uh, of spiders, both spiders that I find in the wild here in the UK and also the spiders that I have had the privilege of keeping over the years. Um, I, I'm not a photographer. Like I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know photography. Well, I don't, I'm flying by the seat <laughs> of my pants. Most of the time when it comes to the photos that I take, I have a pretty decent camera. It's, it's nothing crazy special. It's not professional level, but you know, I have a, a Canon DSLR, um, and I have a hundred mil macro lens, a hundred millimeter macro lens and another, um, clip on macro lens that goes on top of that, that makes it a little bit more capable of getting in close. Mm. Um, so again, it's not like a, it's not like a super, you know, uh, macro setup or anything. It's very, very basic, but it gets the sort of results that I need. And some of the spiders that I work with are huge. So I don't really need, <laughs> don't really need to get in, like, you know, super macro on those because they're already massive and you can see them from across the room anyway. But, <laughs> but um, certainly with a lot of the smaller spiders that I've kept and that I've worked with, some of them have been super tiny. So we're talking like maybe a millimeter to a millimeter and a half long. They're tiny. So being able to take macro photos of those so that I can see them properly is useful when it comes to illustrating them. So my illustration work is primarily um, watercolor, ink and watercolor. So, you know, there are some brightly colored illustrations of the spiders that I mentioned earlier where I've, you know, tried to get in there with the colors that I see. And then there's some that are more just kind of like pen and ink, black and white illustrations that just focus on details and accuracy. So, you know, where their hairs are on their body or, you know, what their eye arrangements are, all that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. So when you take these pictures, um, do, 
do you throw them into Photoshop or do, do you edit them at all just for folks that are wanting to maybe, you know, if they're starting from ground zero, um, what do you do with your photos after you, you snap a picture of your lovely spiders? I'm really lazy. So I like this app. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, tell us about it. Like I, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing. And I take pictures of Bunsen and Beaker that people are like, wow, that's so good. And I'm like, I'm literally using my iPhone and I'm trying not to get my shadow in the picture. Like that's <laughs> all I do. You're you know, gonna like I know nothing. No, you're going to like this then because I also know nothing. So I do have, <laughs> <laughs> I do have Photoshop and Lightroom on my computer and I do use them sometimes, but I, um, I use my photos mostly for outreach stuff. So online posting on Twitter or, you know, on Instagram, I, I like to be able to have it on my phone so that I can post it on the go. So what I tend to do, my phone and my camera will communicate. I can, com I can connect my camera to my phone and download the photos that I've just taken straight from my camera to my phone. And, um, Google have an app called Snapseed, which is free. It's a little bit glitchy, especially if you've got a lot of photos in your camera roll, like me, I have 50,000 and I really need to clear them out. Um, but it's, it's amazing for a free app. It's not all full of ads or anything. It's just, it's got a load of functions on it that you can use to tweak your photos to make them ready for, you know, posting online. So if it's something just as simple as cropping it into a square for Instagram, okay. you can do that in seconds, but there's a whole load of other stuff on there as well. So there's various different adjustments that you can make to like contrast, saturation. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. That's important. That kind of so <laughs> this app has uh, it's, it's very user friendly. I have to say, like, it's very okay. easy to sort of play around with it. Um, and it's very quick and easy to use. So it's perfect. If you're just starting out, if you, if you are like me, you know, you've got a camera and you can take it photo with it, but you don't really know too much about what you're doing in terms of like lighting or, you know, making it look fancy in camera you know it's like I don't know how to how to do all of that in camera at the moment like how to get it right when I'm actually taking the photo so oh I rely goodness, on yeah. just these little tweaks that I can do in that app for fixing up my and, photo and one more time what's the app called uh T it's called Snapseed Snapseed okay yeah. oh you know what mm -hmm. I have Snapseed on my phone yeah, I, you, you had said that and I was just interested in what you were, I'm sorry, I did the stupid thing where I was like more interested in what it does than the name of the thing. Yeah. So I was a bad interviewer right there. I apologize. I was like, I, whoa, this I sounds know. cool. Right out of my head what the thing was called. So. <laughs> I know a lot of people do already use it because I mean, like I said, it's a Google app. It's not a big secret or anything, mm. you know, so it's already out there. But if, if you're just starting out and you're wondering what to use, that's a pretty good one that you can download for free that does a lot of things. I think in terms of free apps that aren't just like just completely loaded full of ads and really difficult to use, like Snapseed is a good one to start out with. And it'll let you, on, you know, it'll give you a better understanding of what kind of things you want more of so that then you can go and research apps that might do more of that thing and, you know, just get a bit more sort of concise, lock it in a bit more. But it's a good starter point, I think. Yeah. Oof, you know what? You know what I'm struggling one. with right now. Oh, I'm what? sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. Go ahead. Sorry, right. so no sorry. worries. I was just saying I'm not sponsored by Google in any way. This oh. Is all <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. Don't you wish yeah. you were sponsored by Google? Get some of that oh. Google money. <laughs> Hell yeah, it would solve a lot of my problems. <laughs> I know us too. Um, what I'm struggling with right now with photography is like we. It's winter. We're losing light so quickly because natural mm -hmm. light is so good to take pictures in. Yeah. But like it's dark at like four thirty now, which is ridiculous. So yeah, I find I it's, know, it's probably the same for you guys. You're about our same. I mean, oh, you're yeah. a little further south than us, but I mean, it's the same yeah. Kind of I mean, latitude. it's half past four in the afternoon now, and it's pitch black outside. So yeah, yeah it's it's annoying. But I find that with my um, DSLR, my macro setup, light like oh. natural light is not really a thing. Like I it, in daylight, I'm not taking photos without the flash because they come out super dark. So you know, I mean, gotcha, I know there's gotcha. ways I can get around with that. I can get around that, but I use my flash a lot, so I can actually Smart. go out in the dark and find spiders at nighttime and take oh, photos. Oh, cool. Yeah. Up, but I absolutely cannot do it with my phone. No way. No, I no do, way. It's just not possible. So no, the no the i the iPhone is good for point and shoot, but as soon as it gets dark, it's garbage. So <laughs> yeah. maybe I need to invest in a better camera. I think that's what I'm kind of learning from this little interview here. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, thank, thanks for talking to us about your illustrations and photography. Now we will, of course, uh, link to your Twitter mm -hmm. and uh, and. Uh, so people can take a look at what you do. Uh, I normally ask this at the end of the interview, but, but it's more poignant right now. Do you have, is there any place people can go to look at your photography and art? Yeah. Um, 
on my Twitter, tw- link- linking to Twitter is a, is a great idea because okay. on my Twitter, in my bio, I have a link to a link tree, which shows you all of my stuff on the gotcha. internet. So okay, link tree. Go, yeah. yeah, if you go to the link tree link in my bio on Twitter, you'll find a link to my Instagram, the scientific Instagram, um, where there's a lot of spider macro photography and some of the pictures of my artwork as well. Um, if you go to, there's a, pa- a link to my Patreon page. I have a Patreon page where oh, cool. I, I don't post on there a whole hell of a lot because it's, I treat it kind of as a tip jar. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of my outreach on Instagram and mostly on Twitter, I have to say. Um, and then, you know, I get involved with things like this, for example, podcast interviews, wherever I can. So my Patreon is there. Like I, I do send out perks to the people who sign up to my Patreon, um, depending on what tier you sign up to like yeah. it's either a monthly thing or a one-off when you sign up um it's not expensive it's either two or five dollars a month like you barely notice it um so yeah i don't post to my patreon crazy often but like i do send out macro photo wallpapers every month um so you can find the link to that there is a lot of stuff on there so if you want to have a look through the things that i've posted in the past there's loads of macro photos and like oh, informational cool. posts on there some um family profiles like spider families that i think are cool i've written big profile uh, um, entries on there about them with lots of information about them um some care sheet stuff for people who want to keep things like jumping spiders in captivity all that kind of stuff there's loads of stuff on patreon that you can look at but everything that i put online is under that link tree link in my twitter bio you know what t i'm just looking through your instagram page and it's Mm -hmm. stunning these pictures are amazing thank you look at them all (laughs) thanks oh what's this one it's I don't know what it is. I like this one. He's got like red banding on his legs. Um, I don't know. I don't know anything about spiders. I'm so sorry. Does it say anything in the caption? Okay. I'm sorry. This is useless for people because this is a podcast. (laughs) It says Brachfimala Arutum. Oh, Brachfimala Arutum. Yeah. So she is a tarantula. Oh, Um, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people will be familiar with the Mexican red knee tarantula. It's the first thing that a lot of people think of. So like black with these orange knees. Um, it's related to that spider. But the the one you're talking about, Brachypelma auratum, has these beautiful, vivid, like reddish kind of um, markings on its legs with like, I don't know, it's, it seems to be far more vibrant in its markings than the, the Mexican red knee. Yeah, it's super it's cool. Like, yeah, it's, they're all, they are like flames, like red through to orange through to yellow. And it's just like on that dark black background as well. It's a really beautiful contrast. If you guys would like to see more, head to How do you not have <laughs> hundreds of thousands of followers? These are so cool. <laughs> Everybody needs to go on your Instagram page. I, normally, I, we do all of this at the end, and I'm just derailing <laughs> my schedule here. Look no at worries. this little spider with his eyeballs. He's super cute. This is he's I'm hiding saying. under a leaf or she's oh. under a leaf i don't know this yep. okay i'm gonna get off of this i'm sorry i'm sorry t <laughs> it's all good it's fine <laughs> all right um okay so back to the interview blah blah, blah. um <laughs> okay thanks for sharing us thanks for sharing with us about uh how you take your your pictures and the app you use and and i hope people check out your link tree and your pictures Um, let's move on to the standard questions we ask our guests in the interview. And one is for a pet story. Um, we (laughs) ask our guests to share a pet story from our life. Now I know this is the podcast emphasis on pause, but we do not discriminate any pet story. Um, (laughs) do you have a, do you have a pet story you could share with us, T? Yes, I do. And it's terrifying and it doesn't involve spiders. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. So I, am. Uh, also very into my reptiles and amphibians and in a past life I worked as a zookeeper I've worked at you know reptile centers and stuff all sorts I've kept all manner of reptiles throughout the years and I think we're probably going back to I'm going to say 2013 now I had a couple of monitor lizards um, one of which it was a savannah monitor his name was Steve, but it actually turned Steve. out to be, yeah it actually <laughs> turned out to be a girl so Steve oh, the girl. Steve yeah. at- yeah. No, we just kept it as Steve. It just really oh, okay. suited her. No, it just, Steve just suited her. But anyway, she wasn't fully grown. She was only about three feet long, including her tail. I say only, that's still pretty big. Um, I had just been over to Los Angeles and I got back and was just doing a check around everyone. And I noticed that Steve, you know, her nails were looking a little bit long. Time to clip her nails. So Bearing in mind, I've literally just got home from the airport. I am jet lagged. I am not thinking straight. I am not with it at all. I'm just on autopilot. I'm like, okay, (laughs) Steve needs her nails clipped. So I get Steve out of her enclosure. I pet her a little bit. You know, she's 
Steve was, mm, I don't know how to describe Steve really. She was sweet, but she was also a bit of a brat. You know, she was <laughs> She used to act out and she used she she'd have a bit of an attitude sometimes, but for the most part, once she was out of her enclosure and you know being handled, she was fine. So I kind of popped her over my shoulder while I'm looking for the nail clippers, and um, my mum's with me, and we're talking, and Steve's head is right near my face, and Steve sees my mouth moving, and Steve is a visual hunter, so Steve's hunting uh, sort of impulses her prey response is triggered by movement she sees my mouth moving and she grabs it so she she bites down on my mouth like on my lip and I mean I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with monitor lizards or you know they, they bite down and they don't tend to let go terribly easily if they're you know pretty bent on eating something uh so she's clamped down on my mouth and my mum's like uh what's going on um what's happening she's starting to panic and I'm having to keep it yeah I'm having to keep as calm as I can even though I'm thinking dude like she's either gonna bite this off swallow it and I'm you know like I'll lose my lip or I mean, oh my goodness or I'm gonna have to do something to get her off my face now um obviously your listeners can't see what I look like but one of the things that I've been known for for a long time now is having ridiculously long pointy nails <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, mum, it's fine. I'm just going to take her upstairs. Mind you, I've got a lizard on my face. So it sounded more like. <laughs> but <laughs> So I take her out of the room and I just I kind of put my finger inside her mouth and just kind of poke her in the roof of the mouth with my pointy nail. And she's like, oh, I don't like that. And let go of me. And I'm bleeding. I've got these gashes on my upper lip. Um, she's like these three pretty deep lacerations on my upper lip and there's there's blood going everywhere and I'm like this is really not good so put her back in her enclosure went and cleaned it up had to go to the doctor for um, I had to get my tetanus shot shot updated um, and antibiotics always always with the antibiotics if you get bitten by anything (laughs) but I went straight and got my antibiotics I was fine there was no infection I got a little bit of an ulcer on the inside of my lip where she'd sort of cut me just like on the inside where it's softer skin Mm -hmm. um it was really painful for a while but it healed up fine and now in certain lights you can see the really really fine little white scars that i have on my upper lip from it but the moral of the story is (laughs) the moral of the story (laughs) the story is don't be an idiot Never, ever, ever lose sight of the fact that these are wild animals. Just because they're in your house does not mean that they don't have the instincts of a wild animal. Just because I can take her out and put her over my shoulder does not mean she's a puppy dog. You know, you have to have respect for the animals that you're dealing with. And that was entirely on me. It was a momentary lapse of concentration and just me being blasé in a situation where I should have had my wits about me and I should have known that having a monitor lizard right next to my face and chatting away to somebody and her being able to see my mouth moving was probably not the best idea in the world. <laughs> gotcha. Right. Yeah. Cause we're talking about, um, a non mammalian creatures, right? Whereas yeah. like a cat or cat, well, okay, cats and dogs can still attack people. Oh yeah. Um, so that, that goes there, but they maybe have more of a emotional bond to their handler and it, that, that kind of like instinct doesn't come out as easily. Yeah. I think, you know, there's a certain amount of, um, like training a reptilian brain hey, or something yeah like the reptiles you can you can condition them you can train them to an extent but they're not you know they're not bonded to you they're not learning tricks like a cat or a dog does they you know they're not they're not acting on the same level as, as a cat or a dog and you're absolutely right cats and dogs are just at li- as, as much at liberty to attack you if you're oh, doing yeah. something that they don't like you know it's like you have to have respect for animals regardless of what they are i mean i've got a scar on my hand from a hamster people don't tend to think <laughs> oh they did it bite you yeah, they, yeah. Oh, they, they bite so hard. Yeah, they, they bite do, so hard. They have no chill when it comes to biting people. They will just bite <laughs> straight through your skin and hang on. And it's just like, it's cancer, you know? I mean, I, I've been bitten by all sorts of things. We could do a <laughs> podcast episode on everything that's bitten me over the years. Not spiders, though. That's one thing I will say. I've, I've, I, up until August of this year, I was able to say that I had never, ever been bitten by a spider. But I was bitten out in the field um, by one of our native species. And it was nothing. It literally felt like, I don't know if you've ever been stung by a stinging nettle, but that, oh, yeah. initial, that very, very initial kind of zing that you feel, zing. that sharp zing, it was like that, but then none of the burning afterwards. Like there was oh, none of that's... the discomfort afterwards. It was literally just like a pinprick, little zing. And I could see two little punctures where the fangs had nipped me. 
And to be fair, it was well within its right. I was kneeling on it. So, you know, <laughs> by all means, bite me if I'm squashed. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but yeah. Only yeah, if a hundred foot creature kneeled on me, I'd be biting its yeah, leg too. Absolutely. You can best believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is an amazing uh, pet story with an amazing moral, I guess, too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the other standard question we ask our guests is for a super fact. And the mm -hmm. super fact is something that you, you know that when you tell people, it kind of blows their mind a bit. And I've been both smiling and my mouth agape most of this interview. So I don't know if you got anything in your pocket, but I'm sure you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> could oh, you share? Yeah. yeah. Could you share a super fact with us, please? Yes, absolutely. So it has been found that there are species of tarantula in places like Peru and India. And I can't think off the top of my head where else, but certainly in um, South America and in Asia um, that have a special relationship with frogs, a particular type of frog. They essentially, not to anthropomorphize too much, but they almost keep them as pets. <laughs> what? So, yeah. What? So they're, How? They're, what do they do? What? Okay. So basically, <laughs> if we use the South American spiders as an example, because I'm more familiar with that, that dynamic, there are species of spiders in South America in the rainforests. Um, I believe at first they thought it was the genus Xenesthis. Sorry, I can't say it. Xenesthis. Um, but I think there's some speculation now as to whether or not it might be spiders in the genus Pamphibetius. It's quite possibly both and more than just those as well. But basically these spiders, they make burrows and they live in these burrows. And it has been found that these burrows are shared by these little frogs. They're a certain type of microhylid frog. I can't remember the species off the top of my head because it's the spiders that I'm concentrating on mostly. Right. But basically... Spiders have been known and are known to prey on amphibians. So it came as a surprise to the people who found them that these frogs were living in the burrows of these spiders and were not being eaten by them. So they figured that maybe there was some kind of like relationship between them. Maybe there's something going on here. So um, <laughs> they, they were observing and they noticed that the microhylid frogs tend to specialize um, in feeding on ants and ants, are a menace to spiders in a lot of senses. So the tarantulas are not going to eat ants. Ants are capable of stinging. They are capable of swarming and causing all kinds of problems. They're not the kind of thing that a spider wants in its in, in its burrow. So um, the spider will feed on things and there'll be detritus from like previous meals that might be attracting pests, might be attracting ants. The little microhylid frogs are feeding on these small insects that the spider is not feeding on, but that might be causing a nuisance. And in return, the spider is offering protection to the frog because this frog is now dwelling inside a tarantula's burrow, which means that it's unlikely to fall prey to things like lizards or snakes, things that might ordinarily prey on it, because those lizards and snakes are of about the size that could potentially be a meal to the spider as well. Um, so there's this nifty little relationship going on between them. And one of the coolest things that I read about when I was learning about this is that when uh, they observed juvenile Pamphibetius um, spiders with these frogs, they noticed that these spiders, they don't have good eyesight and they will, they'll respond to vibration. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of spiders respond to vibration because they can't see terribly well. And that's certainly the case here. So they would feel the movement of this frog and they would rush at it and they would kind of almost nibble it. So they'd like, they'd, they'd, they wouldn't, bite it straight away they'd, they'd take a look at it and they'd kind of feel it with their fangs and sort of almost give it like a little test nibble and be like oh no no you're a frog you're cool I'm not going to eat you <laughs> had it been anything else it would have been dinner you know so it's like there's obviously some kind of awareness of oh hold on hold up this is a frog I mean it might be because frogs um, and other amphibians you know they have toxins that they can sort of secrete from their skin that are not palatable to creatures that might be trying to eat them so it may be that it was a response to that but it certainly seemed to be the case that with these particular frogs these spiders know what they are and don't want to eat them and are quite happy to coexist with them and like I said to anthropomorphize massively keep them as cool little pets in their houses <laughs> 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 so there you go cool fact i love that it's so it's so beyond the what we yeah. think what animals are capable of right like that's yeah. <laughs> that's like yeah. yeah you're right like if we put our our you know our human understandings on their shoes we're like yeah they're keeping them as pets but that's so wild 
Yeah. That, that is, is a, I mean. that is is like, a super know, fact. It's awesome. When I was saying to you earlier, you know, about people's perception of spiders being very sort of, you know, colored by the media and their portrayal in the media and in pop culture, they miss out on all this stuff. You know, they don't hear about all this cool stuff that spiders are doing and all these really beautiful spiders that are out there and that are just so amazingly interesting. You know, and that's what I'm trying to sort of put across to people online and, you know, in all the work that I do, the outreach work that I do is I just really, really want to get it across to people that they are just so much more than just that scary thing that everyone's afraid of. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I'm going to learn. I'm going to do some more. I'm you've piqued my interest into these type of spiders. I want to learn more about them. So I'm going to do, I'm just going to read more about them. Like I just, I just want to get, I want to know more. Like, it's just yeah. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool rabbit hole to fall into. I promise. Yeah. That's a good rabbit hole. I've fallen into other rabbit holes on the internet and you wind up with like, what did I do with my two hours? Like that's <laughs> yeah, no, this time is, I will not get back. Um, this is a good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, The last section of our podcast is a fun one. We get to know our guests a little bit more outside of what they do for their career. We talk about hobbies and passions. Um, You have a couple that you'd like to talk about, but probably the main one is you are um, hoping to go on an expedition. Do you want to talk to us about that? Yes. So I mentioned earlier in the interview, um, the lab that I work with in Vancouver, um, It is the Aviles Lab at the University of British Columbia. Um, And they are, as I said, primarily concerned with the behavioral ecology of spiders, particularly web building spiders. And they go out to Ecuador uh, every year, obviously when there isn't a pandemic happening, um, to to study spiders in the rainforest, cloud forest, various different areas throughout Ecuador, various different elevations. Um, And... I was working with them on sort of sorting through the data that they had collected in 2019, um, started working with them on it at the sort of, I don't know, mid to late last year. And um, after having done all of that, they invited me uh, to go with them on their next trip, which is slated to happen in around about May of 2022, be out there from May to September, should be anyway. Um, And they asked me to go out there as their research assistant. So for me, that's massive. You know, that's the kind of opportunity that doesn't just present itself, you know, out of nowhere. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. And it's an opportunity to go out there and see environments that I've never experienced before and find spiders that will undoubtedly be new to science. There are loads and loads of spiders out there that are, you know, it's it's the sort of area that is it's not understudied, but there's there's a so much more to find out there. So there are countless species of spiders. I mean, there's spiders that they've collected that I've seen the specimens or photos of the specimens that they won't have been described yet. So for mm-hmm. someone like me who's so interested in taxonomy and the classification of spiders, like to be able to go out there and see things that have not yet been described or classified is just like mind blowing. So that's something that I am um, that, that's very much sort of you know on my mind all the time at the moment, preparing for that both sort of mentally and physically and financially and, you know, just trying to get myself ready to, to go out and do that. Um, it's looking likely that I'll go out to Canada to spend some time with them and do some field work locally in, in that area um, for a little while before we head out to Ecuador. So it may be that I'll be in Vancouver for a month or two beforehand as well. Um, they have um, some amazing scenery and areas in in that vicinity, like Pacific Spirit Park is one of the places that they do a lot of field work that just looks oh. absolutely beautiful. Oh, have you have you not been to Vancouver I've before? Never, I've never been to Canada, so oh, it's all, it'll be super yeah, exciting. The, I'm I'm biased. I'm Canadian, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the Pacific Northwest is. Mm. I've been to many places in the world, and I know there are many places that I have not been to, but it's for me the most beautiful place on the earth. It is yeah, just I'm so totally gorgeous. It looks um, so I'm 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 happy that you get to experience that. Yeah, I really hope I can. I really hope I can do it. I mean, I'm I've I've got a few sort of like health concerns at the moment that I'm hoping mm. are not going to be too long term or are, are not going to stop me from doing this. So I'm just oh, sort okay. of trying to remain positive and keep this whole positive mental attitude thing going and just try and you know it's it's because winter here. You know, it's like it's hit me like a ton of bricks this time this year. You know, and I think a lot of it is just because of the stress of the pandemic and everything else. It's all kind of compounded, and now the winter's hit. Like I have fibro 
fibromyalgia. So it's it's knocked me mm. for six this year. But once the weather starts to warm up and in environments like Ecuador, where it's not cold <laughs> and rainy and snowing and God knows what else, um, I should I should be much better off. So I'm hoping that it'll all go ahead just fine. But that's definitely something that's taking up a lot of my um, time and energy at the moment is is getting myself ready for that, doing my research and trying to figure out what kind of research questions I would like to ask and hopefully answer while I'm over there. Uh, as we as we wrap up the interview, T, um, just a reminder uh, in the show notes, everybody, we will link to your Twitter, and also in the show notes, I can put the the link to all of your different um, like your Patreon page, Patreon page, and your Instagram. So, folks, do check that out. It's so cool. Um, it's definitely definitely worth your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been wow. This has just been fascinating. Um, I'm stunned and, and I'm it's hard to get across in an audio only format. I've just been smiling and I if we had more time and and we had this super size podcast special, I would love to talk more about spiders with you. Uh, <laughs> you know, in, in the future, would you be willing to, willing to come back and talk spiders? Oh god, yeah, absolutely. Any Yay. opportunity to talk spiders, I'm all over it. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been really really fun. I really enjoyed it. Okay, it's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. You know what? I'll start. Something crazy has been going on with Beaker. When I get home, Beaker goes mental. She goes crazy. Like usually when someone goes home, she'll lick your hand and she'll say, oh, hi, hi, how's it going? Here's a toy. Okay, bye. That's how she usually acts. She brings toys to people, right? She brings toys to people. But when I get home, she loses her mind. She tries to get all the attention. She jumps on me. She tries to jump into my arms. uh, And she can't do that because she's a little too big to be doing that. If she was cat-sized, I'd be fine with it. But she's four times cat-sized and four times cat weight. Um, So, yeah, she can't be, like, jumping on me. But, yeah, she, like, when I lay down on the couch, she comes up and lays down with me. Yeah, today, today, Adam was so tired because he came home from school and he was smashed just from being tired and he was sleeping on the couch and Beaker came over and she jumped up onto the couch, jumped onto his chest, started licking his hand and Adam did not even wake up. (laughs) Yeah, with most people, she'll lay down at like your feet or something like that. Yeah, she doesn't lay on you. She lays down on me. (laughs) So yeah, that's that's my story. Beaker being Beaker being lovey dovey. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. Uh, this past week on Tuesday, I went to the farmhouse with the dogs, and it was awesome because Bunsen and Beaker got to hang out with Doc, and everybody got along swimmingly. And um, Bunsen and Beaker were really on the prowl because Gord has other cats there, um, but they were nowhere to be found. But it was great for the dogs because they were using their sense of smell to try and ferret out the other cats, but they were unsuccessful. And then uh, they finally went, huh, I guess we're just going to lay down here. And then I took them home and it was good. It was a good day. And Docky Doc got to hang out with them and that was cute. And that's my story. Bunsen loves Doc. Yeah. It was cute because uh, Beaker would, they both actually came and laid by my feet, but then Bunsen also went and laid by the door, which is his typical MO to be protective by the door, which I thought was awesome. Dad, do you have a story? So I'll piggyback on um, Adam's story about how Beaker's acting maybe a little bit differently. I think she is feeling a little sad and jealous about the cat. Um, Bunsen is unfazed by just about anything. There you can't you can't even tell he's different that there's a cat here be, probably because he really likes the cat and he follows the cat around and he, they get along really good. Um, but Beaker and the cat Beaker and Ginger sometimes have battles now where they have standoffs <laughs> and it's like eleven o'clock at night they decide to have a little standoff um, and then they bark and then Adam's like what's going on because he's tired and trying to get to sleep and I'm just about to go to bed too. Um, so one of the things I've been doing is I've been giving Beaker a little bit of extra attention. I haven't been going out of my way to like spoil her, but I've been doing a little bit of extra training, taking her for a little bit of extra time outside by herself. 
just making her feel like she's still important. If she feels that maybe she's getting your, you slurped, um, her position in the household is getting you slurped by the cat. Um, you slurped? Don't you mean usurped? It's from the office. Oh, yes. <laughs> because Michael you says slurped. you're going to slurp my power. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think we're... <laughs> Yeah, I think we're all cognizant of the fact that having a new animal in the house can be very stressful. And I don't know what the deal is with Bunsen. He's only stressed out when we go to a new house, like a new place. He gets stressed out for a day and then he's normal again. Um, but anything can happen in the house. And he's like, whatever. Windstorm, lightning, tornado. He does that, doesn't care. Um, where Beakers may be a little bit more susceptible to changes. And I think it's important to make her feel like she's a good girl. That's my story. Yeah, she is a very good girl. When Bunsen barks at the wind, Beaker will come down beside me and go, mm, what's he barking at? But I really want you to protect me in case it's something, you know, scary. And Bunsen <laughs> just barks at the wind. Yeah. Bunsen will make Beaker bark at things and she doesn't know why she's barking. Yeah. Well, there's Bunsen right now. Okay. Well, that's all that we have for today on... Uh, story time and this podcast thank you guys so much for listening i can't wait to see you guys next time bye bye well that's the end of another science podcast episode thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show special thanks to arachnologist t francis oh man what a great chat hey that was so awesome (laughs) um and we'd also like to give a special shout out to our top tier patrons on patreon their support allows us to do what we do. So take it away, Chris. Anne Schlarm, Sharon Dotson, Peggy McKeel, Chris Kelly, Samantha Dodd, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Julie Smith, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmenter, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Giger, Leela Periello, Lisa Swartz, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rathert. For science, empathy, and cuteness. And